Cogler Hill developed a checklist for high-performing teams. We asked leaders in development to discuss this and share some examples of high-performing teams that they have seen. I will be speaking from my personal experience on this. Um, it's uh, when I looked at the uh, Hills checklist, um, it looks very both inspiring and very uh, co uh, complete in terms of what an ideal team should strive to implement um, in their practices. Um, but it's also challenging. Um, and to me, in my um, experience working on uh, social justice issues, generally um, creating a common vision for the team is not so much of an issue. Um, I'm surrounded by people who are very driven, who are committed, and who already chose this work, specifically because of their beliefs in human rights and social justice. Um, I think the challenge here is um, building trust um, so that if somebody is making an executive decision, for example, then the other teammates can trust that that's the best decision that's being made. Um, and also uh, creating a balance as a leader, um, striving to create a balance between being inclusive of everyone's opinion, being respectful of the process, at, you know, process that is needed to achieve a common vision, but at the same time, um, you have to sometimes make decisions. And so that's, I think, to me, the challenge. And to get there, one of the ways is to focus on building trust. As I gave an, an example of my boss, let me give an example of one of my managers, one of my reports. Um, the, the, uh, the person is called Dr. Mandeep Daliwal, and she is the, <coughs> the director of our global health team, deals with global health issues, health, HIV, and development. It's, it's called. Um, uh, so um, uh, she was. Uh, the number two of that group, of that organization, of that department within the, the Bureau for Policy and Program Support. Uh, to give you a sense, she has about 100 people working for her um, who are uh, located in New York, Geneva, and five regional locations, Bangkok, Amman, Panama, um, Istanbul, and Addis Ababa, uh, plus a number of country-level antennas about 40 presences in countries that have high prevalence uh, of HIV and AIDS or non-communicable diseases, things we work on. Um, so uh, uh, Mandeep, uh, her boss, uh, leaves for another position. He, he leaves the organization, goes over to UNICEF, and there is a succession recruitment to decide who would be the, the person. And, and I think uh, uh, from the beginning, um, she looked like she could step up to the plate because she met already in her number two role. And very much as soon as she took on the office of being the, the head of that department, uh, several of the, um, uh, of, of the, the, the items on the, on the checklist. She was very able to define a, a, a need and a goal. The need, and the need was to um, uh, put back, but th there were several, several needs. One, to rediscuss uh, and bring back to the table the issue of, of intellectual property and the cost of medicine, the access to medicine issue. The old issue of whether trips or not trips and, and how, how can we have people who usually cannot afford treatment and medicine actually access uh, medicines that have become so expensive, cancer, HIV, and so forth. Second, she wanted to deliver global fund grants. You're familiar with the global fund? The, 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 the global fund is a funding structure for uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, of which we are one of the main implementers. Um, uh, she, she, wanted to, uh, she wanted us to be very successful and very responsive in implementing the grants. To give you a sense, our largest grant is a grant of about $400 million in Zimbabwe. Uh, we work um, in life-saving activities to deliver uh, life-saving treatment and medicine in uh, countries of the world where others uh, won't go or can't go. Syria, inside Syria today, 
uh, inside South Sudan, in Somalia, in, um, um, we work in the Palestinian occupied territories, and so forth. Um, um, she was, um, she established very soon after uh, uh, getting, uh, getting the job, um, very clear performance measurement uh, systems. Um, uh, some of them would be quantitative and very objective, very measurable, if you will. Money in, money out is the easy one. How much did you mobilize? And what is your delivery ratio? Um, but others, a little bit more nuanced, like um, management delivery ratios. So how much does your management structure cost for every dollar that you deliver, that you effectively get out of the door? Uh, or uh, uh, even more um, nuanced ones like, like um, um, performance measured as influence. And the other thing that I find a, 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 a very good example of team leadership is that she has used the resources vested in that team to grow the business. So she, she hasn't uh, relied or, or, or she didn't uh, sit on, on her laurels, a well-oiled uh, machinery, a well-functioning team, <clears throat> but has tried to interest them and to invest them into uh, new issues. For instance, we have gone into clean procurement of medicine. Procurement of medicine by national health services um, is a tricky business. Uh, very, very rife with corruption and uh, very prone uh, to wrongdoings. She's gone into procuring medicines for the government of the Ukraine in very trying circumstances and in an international market that is complicated. So, so growing the business, setting new objectives for people who um, had been very ambitious uh, three, four years ago, but had, had been successful and success uh, according to the objectives of last year leads to a certain comfort zone syndrome. You know? You've been successful, you do more of the same because you know you're going to continue being successful. Instead of that, she said, yes, let's continue being successful, but let's build on that success to reach new heights, to look for, for new objectives. When we talk about team leadership, the first thing that comes to my mind is interdependence in a team. So for instance, if I am an introvert and I am good at financial management and I have good critical thinking skills and you share exactly the same strengths that I have, we wouldn't make a very good team. On the other hand, if I have the same qualities and you are good at risk management and program management and you are good, good with relationship building, then we would make a very good team because we would be dependent on each other. You know, what is my weakness is your strength. So, so this is what I find very useful. If you, if you design, if you have the opportunity to design a team, select members so they can, you know, by default depend on each other. And to give you an example, many, many years ago, I worked with this organization where I was part of a team. There were five of us. And our job was to, you know, develop grant applications for our development organization. So in the very beginning, our organization sent us on a four or five days uh, visit to a health station. It was very informal. It was, it was like an outing. And, you know, we were getting to know each other. Some somewhat trust building was there. And we were getting familiar with each other's strength. And when we came back, there was kind of a semi-formal exercise where we built, tried to build a shared vision for our team. What does success look like? We did not make assumptions on each other's behalf. So we all spoke about what is success to me, and we you know, combined that into, into a vision for our team. And we did a similar exercise for every grant application that we prepared, how does success look like? And then, you know, the key was that each member was unique. So I was, I was good with program management and academic writing. Another colleague was good at risk management, and he had a lot of information about local communities. Another colleague was good with uh, finance. Another was good with you know, relationship building. So he was the one always speaking to the donors, so, so on and so forth. And every day, we would meet in the morning. We would pitch our ideas. 
and we will criticize each other in a professional way. We had set guidelines for that. And you know, it, it worked so well. And by the, up until I worked with that organization, we developed some nine applications and we actually won four, which, you know, if you know the, if you had known the context is a, is a great number, you know, four out of nine. So yeah, to me, interdependence, shared vision, you know, cohesion, these are the key things that you need, need, need to have if you want to have high performing teams.